This lecture is going to be about programming languages, programming paradigms, more of an overview of what, what you know, the, the span, like the whole world of like, there's a bunch of different programming languages and a little bit into like why, why there is a lot. I'm going to try to focus a little bit more on what it means to you in terms of navigating this world of there's a bunch of different tools, sorry, different, different programming languages which I sometimes refer to as tools, and how might you make sense of all this overwhelming amount of information? Because you might have to be, at some point in your life, learn a new language, or you have to um, explain to maybe a manager why you chose a certain language to work on something. So that's, that's more of the focus of this. Um, we're not going to go too much in the nitty gritty beyond, you know, what are the different paradigms because uh, most of the details of how to use them uh, could be saved for a programming language course. Um, that's where you could spend a whole semester discussing and learning all of that stuff. Um, here we're focused, you know, in this class about software development, uh, working on software teams. And so programming languages is just one way to see how there's different problem solving techniques. So the learning objectives for this uh, lecture, this topic in particular, is to understand these things. Programming paradigms are different groupings of programming languages. Each one is referring to a predominant way of expressing problems in code. Um, all the programming work is surrounding this idea of abstraction, which is a pattern uh, recognition, pattern um, expression. Right? So us as computer scientists, we create programs after observing the world and looking for the patterns and recognizing the patterns and then writing scripts to you know work with those patterns. In Java land you've learned a lot about objects and how how you have to protect the data and you have to restrict access in the class. So the class is the blueprint and that's where you define public, private methods, variables, etc and so on and so forth. Um, and then once you invoke a class, then it becomes an object, and that's where you can pass state into it um, and retrieve state as well. So that's one way of thinking, um, to see the world as a bunch of objects and classes and so on. Um, I'd say that the Java land uh, world is pretty strict and uh, requires a lot of rules in order to get by it. So what I mean by that is, in the last lecture, I showed a couple different examples of programming languages using BNF notation, which is a way to, um, if you don't remember, BNF is a way to formally express uh, uh, the syntax of a programming language. So I showed a couple different languages and uh, in the Java language, you had to declare a class name, and within that, you would declare a main method in order for that class to be run. In your Java program, you must have a main method. You can have a class without the main method, but in order to run a program, you need a main method, so um, you had to define that. Um, and then there were a couple other program language examples where you didn't have to create a class, you didn't have to create a method, you could just simply say print hello world or print uh, sorry, or display hello world and it would just run. So um, arguably you can say that it's slightly easier to remember not having to do certain things, not having to write it a certain way. And in fact, um, 20 years ago when I was learning Java as a way of programming, it was a little more challenging because I had to remember to follow a bunch of different rules. And it wasn't until more recently in the last five years that I was exposed to other languages that didn't have such a uh, 
um, vivid and rigorous set of rules that I was then able to work a little bit more with the logic and expressing code, uh, expressing my ideas in code without worrying about, oh my gosh, did I match exactly what the compiler needs? That works for me. And I have over time learned that, yeah, you know what? It's okay to explore different languages and different ideas because maybe the way my mind works is better with some languages than others. And that's what I'd like to convey through this lecture is that there's different ways to ex express your problems and some might work better for the problem you're working on. Some might work better because of how you think as like problem solving method. Okay, moving on. It's good to think about the history of programming languages in the sense that um, the sophistication of different programming language uh, inventions have improved over time as hardware got better, as um, ideas and researchers found new abstractions and new ways to do things, and as people who were creating languages got better at expressing certain uh, ex abstractions and so on. There's so many ways to slice the cake here, but um, basically there's a lot of, a lot that's happened over the last 100 years in terms of programming language uh, domain of knowledge. Um, before listing out all the different eras, I wanted to bring up this analogy of a toolbox. If you were um, wanting to hang a picture on the wall and in your toolbox you had a hammer, um, well hopefully you have nails and not screws. Why? Because then you could install that nail into the wall in the right location. And all you need is one, so you don't really need a level. Uh, but let's say you want to install a shelf, a wall-mounted wall shelf. Well, now you've got two points that are needed, not just one. So hopefully now you have a level to help measure how level that shelf is. And then, you know, hopefully you have another tool that can uh, not just nail nails into the wall, but maybe like a screw to um, fasten the shelf to the wall, and then maybe perhaps some anchors to make sure it can stay and all that. So um, this analogy I'm trying to show is that depending on the problem, you're going to need different tools. And the more tools you have in your toolbox, the more problems you can solve. So that's really what I'm trying to get at in terms of the um, the motivations behind learning a different programming language isn't so much that you have to know it, but just knowing about something new and knowing how to learn something new can at times help you expand your horizon and expand your, uh, your value to future employers. So, uh, that's, that's more of the focus of where we are at. And alongside to that is that over time as different programming languages evolve and as different uh, programming languages added new features to their languages, there's different eras of programmers, right? Back, back in like the early days, they were just learning how to set things up. They didn't really have very good debugging tools. They were a little bit more focused on planning before coding. They didn't have very many resources to trial and error. So it was think, plan, measure 50 times, cut once. Whereas nowadays you could d avoid measuring and just like cut it like 50 billion times. And then you're going to get that generational gap, right? So um, anyway, I'm just trying to refer to that. Like you can see how this toolbox analogy applies to the evolution of the programming language landscape. Okay, so back to the slide. About a hundred years ago, a computer was actually referring to a human doing calculations with a calculator and not with like a calculator on her smartphone or, you know, the one with the buttons. 
maybe it was an abacus, you know, if, if they had access to one. Or maybe it was some other, like, uh, tool that worked like a calculator, but not as we know it. There's probably a lot of paper writing and writing records just to make sure things lined up. But anyway, a uh, hundred years ago, the idea of a computer is very different than today. Then around World War II, um, you know, a little before then and during, a lot of innovation happened because they were trying to crack um, encrypted messages. You know, each side of the war was trying to crack messages. And so, actually, was it World War II? It could have been World War One or World War II. Um, and this, me not knowing, is an example of why history class is so important for students so that you could reference things correctly. Um, right, so anyway, because of the war, there was a lot of motivation to innovate in order to solve certain problems such as cracking a um, cryptography thingy majiggy, cracking encoded messages that the other side of the war is passing to each other in order to win the war. See, uh, technology kind of follows this innovation path based on problems. And uh, there's mathematicians back then who contributed a lot to this computer science field. And so that's partially why mathematics is important for, um, for computer science students to learn but also because through mathematics, you're able to learn analytical problem solving skills. And that's what's needed to be able to solve software programming skills, or pro software programming challenges. Um, okay, so then let's move forward into like the 50s. They had Fortran, which is a language where you can write formulas. And that was very novel back then. And then um, by the 60s, they were really thinking about artificial intelligence and they were thinking of how to make the coding process more efficient for business use and a lot of innovations, a lot of innovations came out of there. So then you start seeing diversions of ideas. You had some people trying to describe problems in terms of um, declaring a bunch of rules, not saying declare processes for the workflow, but just describe a bunch of rules. And so that's where you start seeing a diversion. And then further from there, more languages evolved. Um, you still had the command line to work with the machine. So you had the Unix and the Linux stuff, command line stuff. And then you had object-oriented programming in the 70s also. And then you had the internet that came about, which then led to more innovation because then people could exchange information much quicker than snail mail and the telephone. Because you can imagine like sending somebody source code on the screen is probably going to be a lot more efficient than trying to read out loud code over the phone. And then in the late 80s and early 90s is when operating systems and uh, graphical operating systems became popular. So then there's like a lot more programming languages that helped with expressing the spatialness of like presenting information on the screen. So you can see like depending on when a programmer was like professionally employed, they're going to be kind of focused on different kinds of problem spaces and different workflows to get things working. Okay. So why are there so many different languages? Well, I did touch upon this a little bit, which is to say that I was mentioning uh, there's different problems and then there's innovation that happens because it's trying to solve certain problems. Like that's probably the, the predominant way of like reason about why there's so many programming languages is because there's a problem and it can be solved or uh, it could be solved better by some new programming language. So that's why there's so many different languages. If you look around at all the different languages out there, you can describe them. Uh, some are considered specific purpose, such as awk or Perl is for working with files and searching for data. Or I should say Perl's for searching for 
strings in a file and awk is for reporting on data files. Then you have general purpose languages to work with creating websites or working with device drivers. And then you could have specific applications, which is more of what we're a little more focused on because most of us are probably going to be exposed to programming problems for application development. That is probably where most of us are going to end up. Most of students from Brooklyn College will end up. Some of you may end up in research. Some of you may end up in hardware. But um, at least in this class, we're going to focus on the idea of like applications and like working for end users, uh, you know, their needs. And then the other reason why there's um, so many languages is that maybe there was something missing from another earlier coding uh, programming language. Um, or maybe like the person who invented it didn't want to maintain it anymore, pass the baton over to somebody new, and instead of keeping the same name, they wanted to rename it. So that's probably why uh, for, for some languages. Um, so further, what I'd like to describe now are various different things. Um, describe and classify programming languages by their features, and then just kind of some background. And then what I really want to focus on um, in terms of all the possible paradigms for this class is to focus on functional declarative. I think it's a little bit um, more suited towards describing web technologies. A lot of web technologies are declarative in nature because you're describing what should happen as opposed to how things should happen. And this is a very different thinking style than object-oriented programming. So um, I think it's a good way to like get your minds ready before the web development stuff to just be able to think about it a little bit more in a like abstraction, a computer science theorist way. So the outline for this talk is going to start with programming paradigms, go over some uh, various details that I won't read aloud from, and then um, go into some of the language design considerations, but not in too much depth. And then followed by program development and ev evolution of languages. Programming paradigms. What are they? It is a way to describe and classify programming languages by their features. This is not really to say by concept. Um, there are some researchers out there who disagree with this classification using paradigms. And I know that's going to add to confusion here, but I'm just trying to say that like, even though a lot of the programmers in today's world say we're just going to classify it by paradigms, it's kind of like, um, you know, psychologists saying, let's classify everybody's personality using the MBTI uh, framework. Well, that's just like a popular thing. Is it the only one? No. Is it the right one? It kind of depends on the situation. Anyway, going back to para uh, programming paradigms, you're going to hear this a lot. So this is why I'm bringing it into this class, because even like during a technical interview, or if you're uh, networking in a professional event, you might hear this, so you might as well be acquainted with this concept. Um, okay, so programming paradigm is a way to describe and classify programming languages. It is usually a set of principles or concepts related to that, or maybe like a method um, or how an algorithm should be expressed. It can also be like a philosophy or a certain style, general approach to writing the code, so as you can see, it's kind of a lot about like the practice and, and the workflow. Okay, it's not necessarily saying syntax only. The syntax kind of supports the principles and the philosophies, but it's more to say that each paradigm has a different belief system. So the common paradigms available, and this is where you should know the keywords, is imperative, declarative, structured, procedural, functional, object-oriented, and logic. Um, some of these words are going to be like, you're going to hear way more often than others, and that would be the more um, the more commonly heard ones. Uh, imperative, declarative, structured, 
Uh, oh, no, 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 sorry. Imperative, declarative, um, functional, and um, logic. Well, I guess it depends on who you talk to as well. Um, some you're going to hear a little bit more in the research world. Some you're going to hear a little bit more in industry. You definitely should know, like, if there's only three to choose from that you should know um, would be declarative, uh, functional, and object-oriented. Everything else you should know, but, like, things that you should take away from this class is the three. Object-oriented from the bottom, going up, object-oriented, functional programming, and declarative programming. We're going to focus on functional and declarative programming in the next lecture slide deck. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll go into more detail there about like what it is, how to think in that. The last thing I want to say about this slide is that it kind of describes how there's like different characteristics of each of these. Like it goes in and describes like, for instance, with structured programming, the third one, saying programming with free with, uh, excuse me uh, programming with clean go to free nested control structure so like the structured idea it comes from um, I think it was introduced I want to say with algal 60 the idea of being able to nest your code so then you don't have to run through everything all at once it can increase efficiency because you have branching logic to say use this if certain conditions exist do the other thing if something else exists or only stick to this section until some logical uh, control flow um, so yeah we're gonna go through some of these um, I'm gonna skip over some of these slides and if you're following by video feel free to pause the video and you know read through the stuff I think it'll be a little less exciting for me to read through it one by one so I'm just gonna move through this quickly um, this chart here is showing that there's different paradigms across the top here and I try to express uh, by row how each of these are different so if you wanted to compare how imperative and object-oriented um, are different and you know what they're doing is I try to come up with similar parts of description and I got it from these resources I try to compare uh, for each of these how they how their belief system and their philosophy is a little different from each other so that's how I organize this table the other thing to know about this is on the left it's going to be a little bit more about implementation writing the code where you're tracking where the memory is stored and how to move the memory storage from place to place you know as you work with uh, the program whereas on the right it's more abstraction so it's writing a little bit more about what is the universe of uh, the the rules as opposed to all right save this data then uh, transform data etc so the difference is on the left you've got a little bit more of like step by step and then on the right more about like the rules and and the facts and um, a little more higher level thinking um, and also what some folks say about the logical declarative nature is that it's a little less muddled in the details whereas the procedural or imperative tends to be a little more like focused on exactly um, the nitty-gritty stuff. Um, if we were to talk about the levels of abstraction, and this is just presenting the columns from left to right as a bottom-up um, kind of approach. So the levels of abstraction, you can consider, and I don't know if this is like correct for all, but this is like one way to view it, if it helps you to picture this graphically in your mind, is that all languages have control structures, so that's a feature of all language, but then as you go up, uh, up the abstraction ladder, you're going to have 
features that are a little bit more specific to that paradigm. Um, and then some of these would be like, they don't exist. So for instance, with uh, object oriented, you have classes and objects and inheritance. And then in the upper levels, you don't really have that. So not a very good chart. I do have to work on this a little bit more, but I just want to give a sense of like the idea of abstraction. It could be table form, or if you just want to picture it in a different way, that works as well. To give a few concrete examples, um, I have a few slides uh, showing how the code looks like. You know, hopefully that helps illustrate a little bit more tangibly what each of the paradigms look like. Um, I'm starting with the imperative programming, so going from the more step-by-step -step into the more abstract uh, in HR. So here in imperative programming, control flow is explicit. You want to show exactly how computation takes place step-by-step. -step. So you have, like for instance, starting from index 0 to the end, and you want to add one each time, and you want to say if certain things, do this, and it's very like um, uh, close to, I guess, each step of the problem. It uses this idea of structured programming, which is you have a block of code and you can, you know, uh, have a little bit more control over the code because you have the structures and you could even have Maybe like this add uh, method is maybe like defined somewhere else. And then if you had like another like else statement that does subtraction maybe, then that would be like an example of structured programming. Um, before I continue, I do want to make a point that some languages have more than one paradigm. So that just kind of like adds to the confusion. So this paradigm is kind of like more of like a way to describe a language as opposed to like strict uh, classification, the way like uh, uh, the way the, uh, the the biology species chart works with like you can only be one or the other and not both. This programming paradigms concept is a classification scheme, but it can also uh, be a little bit overlapping for some programming languages. Like for instance, Python can be written both in object-oriented programming way with classes or with structured and imperative way where you don't have classes. So it really depends on the language. Okay, now moving on to object-oriented programming. Um, if you think of Java, you have to write classes in order to have blueprints from which you can create objects from by invoking the classes. And uh, in order to send data into it, you need some way to like pass inputs in and then behind the scenes inside that uh, object, it's working with that data and then spitting back out information. So that's if you're using object oriented where one class is invoking objects and passing data and then using that data. Next, we have something totally different, declarative programming. And this is where control flow is implicit, meaning you don't have to say, go from one to two to three and so on. Uh, remember how in imperative programming you have I++ plus plus to say uh, I equals zero, then followed by one, two, three, etc. Here we have filter as the function and, and there's no like specific stepping through things. Um, so that's an example to show like it's a little bit more implied than explicit. In declarative programming, the idea is that the programmer only states what the result should look like. They don't explain how. 
In terms of programming in a declarative way, this allows the programmer to focus on what should happen and focus on designing a really great set of rules that describe what the problem looks like and what the solution is, as opposed to worrying about am I passing to memory the correct item and the right um, values and, and you know memory type stuff. There's a lot less emphasis on writing loops and a lot less emphasis on declaring variable names and intermediary variable names in order to do things. Um, logic and constraint paradigms are t typically declarative. These names may be uh, used interchangeably. I think it's only until you're like in grad school or like working specifically on those problems where like using the right word of those matters. At this point, just know that there's probably nuances, but I'm referring to them as the same um, group of things. Functional programming is where you have a bunch of functions and then the functions call each other. So for instance, I can pass a function to a function um, if I wanted to. So for instance, if I want to average two numbers, then I could pass in the results from one function into another. So that's kind of like when you have the mathematical functions with a lot of parentheses and like nested parentheses, that's what it kind of feels like, that it's just you have to work in the order of precedence. Um, this kind of code tends to be less error prone, it's less errors because it has to type check um, the, the type you're passing from one function to another has to make sense, the values have to make sense, and if all of that calculates out to be the right thing, then you know, the debugging process is a lot easier. So that's why some people like it a lot more. Um, you can pass a function to another, which is really powerful. So if you want to say, um, you know, express your problem as a bunch of formulas, it's really easy to do so, especially if you're working in some sort of uh, like business uh, industry that requires a lot of calculations of certain things like that is like a really powerful place to use functional programming ideas and um, last but not least a logic and constraint paradigm which I'm also referring to as um, similar to declarative slightly different but it's like similar to declarative now in logic and con constraint program uh, paradigm you tend to hear a lot more about writing specifying inference rules. So here's an example. Uh, you want to check if something is true. So you can have predicates like animals are being, all dogs are beings. So these are predicates and then clauses is uh, all dogs are animals, Fido is a dog, um, and then all beings die. So you could then conclude an animal Fido will die. So you see how it's just a bunch of rules. It's kind of a sad example here, but I think it does illustrate this idea of rules, inference rules, and declaring rules, not saying how to calculate that, you know, Fido is an animal, but just to say, here are the, here are the rules to follow. Okay, so then on to language design because it's good to know a little bit about language um, considerations, programming language design considerations, in order to get an idea of like if you're learning a new programming language, like what are the parts that you're learning. So, um, it, the, so if you're going to design a programming language, like this is where it's more important. If you're just learning something new, then you know it's just food for thought. Uh, some good language features would include that it's simple in terms of syntax and semantics. It's, it makes for a much easier time to pick up the language if you're new to it and then also easier to uh, 
work with it because you're not maintaining a lot of craft. You're just uh, maintaining the essence. Uh, another good feature is readability, so it's not too obscure to read. This helps reduce uh, feeling like you have a convoluted, complicated block of code because readability helps you think through problems. Safety, as in type safety possibly, or value safety, or like just ways to ensure that you can rest easy and that the execution of this is going to run the way you expect it to. Another good feature is that it's not resource heavy so that it can be used for large systems and that it ports very well to different pieces of a large system. And then also the efficiency and like performance of that language can also be really important, especially the larger of a system that you work with, larger like software, uh, larger user base, then you know the efficiency resource handling is really important. Designing a good language is really hard. There's going to be a lot of trade-offs that the inventor is thinking about. And sometimes your decisions are magically right and other times not so great. So um, there's like no perfect language. I mean, you might have one that you love, but it's probably not going to fit every single problem, right? You're going to see like some problems are like creating a web page. And so HTML and CSS is great for that, but maybe like JavaScript is better for something else. And then maybe like Python's great for parsing uh, a text document. I don't know. Um, all these different languages are created for different purposes. So, you know, they're gonna be great for different problems. Um, so now I'm just gonna go through some of these uh, features, aspects of a programming language very quickly. Um, just so you have an idea of like what are the anatomical pieces of a programming language and you don't need to know this in too much depth you, you just need to know like there are certain common parts of a language so you have the lexical structure so this is like the actual words keywords that you could use operations or sorry operators separators things like that like what are valid characters to use in constructing a program and what are valid keywords to use in order to get certain structures in place. And that would include error types and then maybe like some way to represent the syntax. The next part is some ability for that programming language to check the data type or any sort of type checking. You know, if you're working with numbers, it's numbers not confusing with strings and so on. Some way to uh, process or even pre-process, meaning having some sort of way to make it easier to uh, make it easier for the programmer to input the code, to think about the stuff and maintain stuff, and then have it output to something that's a little more suited for the machine that it's running on. Um, okay, so those are the three that I wanted to focus on for programming aspects. So what is a programming language? It is basically a set of, I guess, rules that you can work with in order to express a problem. Programming languages can either be low level and really efficient for the machine, like assembly language, or it could be really high level that helps the programmer think through the problem. And then that gets translated into machine readable code. So in terms of software development, there are different stages, and this is really important. You want to think about the problem you're working with, and you want to plan out for solving that problem prior to diving into the code. Measure twice, cut once, all right? But in a lot more words here. And then after you create your program, then you want to test it and make sure that for all the different inputs, that you get, or that, that is inputted, you get the expected response. And in order to complete that development life cycle in an efficient way, there's then different um, features of programming languages that help with reusing code 
so that it's one, easier to maintain, and then two, it helps with speeding up the development time. So here's just another like version of abstraction. And this is common with any language, you're gonna have these sort of like products being created. You can have a subroutine, which is basically saying a function. So if I'm gonna reuse the same bits of code to swap, like for instance, in bubble sort to swap two elements, I can have a swap function that does that. And then whether I'm using bubble sort, insertion sort, selection sort, I can always swap. So that's an example of a subroutine. You can have something a little bit uh, bigger, I guess, bigger than that, a little more complex, which is a class library or a framework, which would then just be a bunch of uh, a bunch of functions organized into different classes and objects, and it's just this whole like framework of things you can work with. So this could be like web development. You want a way to easily create web pages and um, have that tie in with the back end. So then there's frameworks for that to be able to pass data from one page to another and then to handle the routes, whatever. Um, you could also have like statistical analysis libraries that have all the different formulas coded up and then all you have to do is call that function, pass in the correct variables and then it'll output the expected thing. Then you can also have like package and software patterns and like these are further abstractions and these happen in all programming languages so you're going to see these words appear no matter where you go these are just like products that people create in order to allow code reuse um, another thing to consider when you're programming is name resolution. So abstraction is very common in computer science and you want to abstract as much as possible, but there are other places where you should not abstract too much. So that would be like, for instance, if you're naming functions and you're naming variables, you don't want to just say A, B, C, D, X, and Y. You really want to take a little bit more time to say, well, if I am calculating I don't know, a, a like dining out experience, you know, I, I want to pay the bill after my dinner. Then I want to say food item uh, or, or, or meal or dish, drinks, dish, side, whatever it might be. And then the cost per unit and then sales tax, subtotal, total, etc. So you don't want to just say, I'm calculating A plus B uh, or, or array of A, sum of array A. Like you want to say sum of, um, I don't know, dish items, right? Like specificity can be really helpful here. And um, different, different parts of a language can be used for naming, so you could have where the variable scope is or the control flow or the method so there's different levels of scope where you can think about the naming and then also the specificity of that name all of this i thought would be funny um, to enhance with a parody book cover uh, called writing code that nobody else can read like the way you name stuff can impact how well it's read. So that's just something to think about. And to um, jump into the next part, or before jumping to the next part, like I just thought this would be a good comic to like leave off on. And that would be that there's different uh, approaches to solving problems with different languages. So um, this comic shows how if you have Python, then everybody's marveling at how awesome it is, but you see that it's not that powerful. If you have Swift, you can be like, wow, I got something cool, but then, you know, there's another release to install. Uh, so it's only great for a short time. Uh, so, you know, there's different different 
characteristics to the world, like the community around each programming language can like impact its usefulness as well.